Adrian Boar is a, a physician scientist uh, working at the uh, Human Oncology and Pathogenesis Program and at the Department of Neurology, uh, which are part of the, uh, which she is also part of the Brain Tumor Center at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And she is uh, very much interested in what we have just discussed, the leptomeningeal space uh, in uh, diseases that affect the, the brain, uh, including uh, metastatic disease and others, including uh, COVID-19. So, Adrian, thank you for uh, accepting the invitation and, and we really look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Manuel, and thank you um, to Iano for hosting this webinar. It's been so much fun to hear um, other people who are interested in the metabolism of the brain. Um, so, can everyone see my slides, yeah? Yes, we can. Good, all right. So here are my disclosures. So as Manuel had just said, my uh, my team really focuses on leptomeningeal metastasis, and this is spread of solid tumors into the fluid-filled spaces that surround the brain and the spinal cord. And uh, here's a drawing in A that gives you an idea of kind of what this looks like clinically. So in the upper panel here in A, you can see by MRI scan these plaques of enhancing disease that sort of um, sit on the on the surface of the brain um, and this is one way that we uh, that we diagnose leptomeningeal metastasis but an important second way that we diagnose it is um, through analysis of spinal fluid and that's in the lower panel here um, and this is typically formed by a bedside uh, lumbar puncture where we collect spinal fluid from the patients and we examine it under the microscope so while any um, solid tumor um, could potentially lead to leptomeningeal metastasis. Um, in modern practice, the most common contributors to leptomeningeal metastasis are breast, lung, uh, melanoma, and to a lesser degree, lymphoma. Um, unfortunately, uh, despite our, our best efforts and really creative um, uh, treatment strategies, the mean overall survival for these patients is, is quite low, uh, with an average of about three and a half months. Um, thankfully, this is a relatively rare complication of cancer with only um, about 8% um, of solid tumor patients um, harboring leptomeningeal metastasis um, at autopsy. Um, and despite all these sort of grim statistics, I think there's actually a, a silver lining, and it's actually from back here in this lower panel, and that's the, the collection of spinal fluid. Um, the reason that I think the collection of spinal fluid is the, the silver lining is because uh, my laboratory and I would really view metastasis as fundamentally an evolutionary problem. So, uh, and as, um, if we kind of go back to our basic biology um, from, from undergraduate, uh, we can recall that the, the three main drivers of any um, evolutionary problem are space and time and variability. And that's really illustrated here in A. This is a Snellen diagram of, of actually of zooplankton in the North Atlantic um, because I particularly like this one. And, and what it illustrates for us is that um, if one is looking in the wrong space or at the wrong time frame, um, you could miss all the variability. And we, I think we all, something we all can appreciate as cancer biologists is that um, variability is where, is really where the biology gets interesting, right? So um, I'll just remind us all of, again, of something I think we, we all know and kind of bring it to the front of our minds, which is that um, humans and mice are very different. Um, humans have vastly more cells, they live vastly longer, and the cancer disease course for, for humans is much longer than that of mice. And this is not to throw shade on mice, as you'll see, I really love mice and we use them quite a lot. Um, but it does suggest that if we're going to study the evolutionary dynamics of um, metastasis that we, we might want to use human samples as our primary tool for discovery. And that, and therein really lies, the, the benefit of leptomeningeal metastasis. Part and parcel of, of caring for these patients is, is the collection of spinal fluid, um, both at diagnosis, um, after diagnosis, and then at set time points through the course of the patient's treatment. So what my laboratory does is we take these samples of CSF and blood and we fractionate them in the lab into cellular and acellular fractions. The cellular fractions are then subjected to um, technologies such as RNA sequencing, um, flow cytometry, and then the acellular fractions can then be subjected to um, cell-free DNA sequencing or proteomics or metabolomics. 
And all of these techniques really allow us to assess with a high degree of, of granularity um, the cancer cell genes that are in play in leptomeningeal metastasis, as well as the microenvironmental contributions. Of course, you know, I've carefully driven, driven sorry, drawn these arrows in one direction because um, analysis of patient samples is, is you know, fundamentally an observational um, approach. So if we want to construct a pathway and if we really want to assemble these, um, these potential uh, uh, molecules into a pathway, well, then we really do need to turn to mouse models. And so that's what we use our mouse models for. Um, so in short, we use the, the human uh, analysis of human samples to determine the molecular what, and then we go to the mouse models to determine the uh, molecular why and how. And I would be remiss if I didn't um, remark that, you know, this technology is really only possible because of modern computational biology that's cap capable of managing these frankly enormous data sets. So when I set up my lab, the, the first thing that we did is we, we worked to um, to see if we could carry out some single cell RNA sequencing on spinal fluid from patients with leptomeningeal metastasis. And to do this, I collaborated with um, Dana Peer and Linus Mazutis. So um, something that I think I didn't really appreciate until I got really in the weeds here is shown here in A. So um, leptomeningeal metastasis is marked by a pleocytosis. So um, normal quiescent CSF has very, very few cells, if any cells. In the presence of cancer cells, we see this pleocytosis. We see an abundance of monocytes and lymphocytes in the space. And that's what you can see here in A in the clinical data. We therefore worked really closely um, with Linus to be able to, um, alter, to, to work on our pipeline such that the cell types that we were collecting on the 10X accurately represented what we were seeing in the sort of old school culture counter clinical data. Um, and when we did that, you can see here in B what we were, what we had. So this is single cell RNA sequencing on the 10X platform from five patients um, with untreated leptomeningeal metastasis. Two of these patients um, had leptomeningeal metastasis from breast cancer and three from lung cancer, and there were about 15,000 total cells sequenced. I'll remind you that, of course, each one of these circles represents a cell and the cells clustered beautifully. And we were pretty delighted. Of course, we expected the T cells and the macrophage to, to cluster, but we were surprised to see that the cancer cells clustered so neatly. So I'll walk you through this briefly. So here in the, in the red and pink colors, you can see the macrophage monocyte populations. Here in the green, you can see the T cells. And in the golden colors, we can see the cancer cells from the five different patients. So with this data set in hand, we then asked, you know, what, what can we possibly ask? We asked one of my favorite questions, which is, how on earth do cancer cells live in the spinal fluid? Um, something that's come up a few times here um, this morning has been this question um, about the, the microenvironment. Um, so when we look here at, in this table in A, you can see a, a comparison of the spinal fluid and the serum. And of course, the osmolarity is going to be the same, otherwise the cells would burst. But in every other aspect, you can see that the CSF is really um, a kind of a posse nutrient environment. You can see that the pH is low, that the oxygen tension is quite low. There's low glucose, low protein, amino acids, et cetera. Um, and so the, the postdoc that um, was working on this project, Yudan Chi, quite wisely said, you know, why don't we focus on the, the nutrient that is the most absent in the spinal fluid, and that's iron. And the, and the reason she did this is that she reasoned that this was going to be providing the most intense selective pressure on the system. So if, we, if you think about this, of course, the null hypothesis would be that the cancer cells don't need iron, and so it doesn't actually matter that there is low extracellular iron in the spinal fluid. And so to address this, Udan um, did some ELISAs looking at hepcidin and transferrin and ferritin. So hepcidin is the, the hormone associated with iron deficiency and inflammation. And this is, uh, these are ELISAs from CSF collected from cancer patients. And in green, you can see uh, CSF from patients who did not have leptomeningeal metastasis, and in purple from those who do. Um, and you can see that hepcidin levels are elevated in patients who are harboring leptomeningeal metastasis. However, the transferrin levels in these uh, patients were equivalent, really suggesting that the cells are indeed deficient in iron, but are acquiring iron through some different means. 
So with this idea in mind, we then went ahead and queried our data set, and we, we worked with uh, computational biologist by Dodas Kisilovas to do this. So he plotted uh, out a nice heat map for us here in A uh, with all of the genes associated with iron binding and iron transport in our system. Um, and you can see along the x-axis here the various cell types clustered. You can see that monocytes and macrophage employ a distinct array of um, genes and gene products to be able to um, access iron. But really interestingly, the cancer cells have a distinct set of their, their own uh, genes that they're employing. To our surprise and really our delight, we found just two genes associated with iron binding and transport that were expressed exclusively in the cancer cells. And those genes were lipocalin 2 and slic 22 a 17 And you can see that here in B in these violin plots where we have the cancer cells in gold with their um, lipocalin 2 expression and slic 22 uh, a 17 expression. And you can see that the myeloid and the lymphoid cells do not um, express these genes to any real degree. So I'll just take a, a step back and remind everyone of lipocalin 2. I know this gene comes up for a lot of us in our, um, our gene lists. So lipocalin 2 is also known as NGAL or neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin. Um, it was originally um, found to co-purify with MMP9. Um, it's a secreted transporter. You can see here's the um, solved crystal structure. Um, it's a beautiful beta barrel protein and it binds iron um, through binding the siderophore. And remarkably, it binds iron with an extraordinarily um, high uh, binding coefficient. What's also important to note for our story is that um, it was originally, of course, as I said, isolated um, co-purifying with MMP9, and its original name is neutrophil gelatinase-associated lipocalin, and it's known to be generated by neutrophils or macrophage during inflammatory processes. So we thought it was, so looking, knowing that and looking back, we thought it was particularly odd that the macrophage were not producing lipocalin 2. And uh, we then set out to confirm our findings that um, that were found sort of on the basis of RNA at the level of protein. And to do this, um, we worked with an autopsy um, series. And you can see here in A and B that um, immunofluorescence of either cancer cells associated with the surface of the brain or cancer cells collected from the CSF of these patients at autopsy. Um, in both cases, the cytokeratin positive population represents the lipocalin 2 positive population, and the IBA1 positive population remains uh, lipocalin 2 negative. Now, of course, these are our samples collected at autopsy, and um, it's entirely possible that um, even waiting three hours after, um, after death may have altered things. And so we confirm this yet again, this time in fresh samples um, collected from, from living patients. Um, and did flow cytometry. And again, we see that the pancytokeratin positive population um, represents the majority of the lipocalin 2 positive population in our series, really suggesting that in the spinal fluid, uh, the, lipo the cancer cells are expressing lipocalin 2 and the macrophage do not, um, really underlying something I think we all appreciate, the, really the unique nature of the brain microenvironment. So secure in our knowledge that lipocalin 2 was important, we really needed to set out and now figure out the mechanism. To do this, we turned to our mouse models. Um, so you can see here in A, um, just a uh, bioluminescent signal of, of a C57 black 6 mouse with uh, leptomeningeal metastasis from a Lewis lung carcinoma model. You can see here that the cytokeratin positive uh, cancer cells are layered on top of the um, the meninges as expected. When we do multicolor flow cytometry, again, we see in our mice what we see in humans, which is uh, pleocytosis with cancer cells representing a, a small proportion of the overall population. If we take a look at lipocalin 2 levels in the spinal fluid, we can see that uh, lipocalin 2 levels are elevated in the CSF of patients harboring leptomeningeal metastasis, as you can see here in D, and our mouse models accurately represent that. Um, as you can see in D. And um, again, taking a look just at a, um, a immuno uh, IHC, you can see that um, the lipocalin 2 staining is really localized um, to the areas of leptomeningeal metastasis.
We next assess the role, if any, of lipocalin-2 to support cancer cell growth in the spinal fluid. To do this, we knock down lipocalin-2 expression through the use of two independent short hairpins and found that inhibiting uh, lipocalin-2 expression inhibited cancer cell growth in the mouse models and provided a survival benefit for the mice, as you can see in B. We then took uh, the reverse approach, this time overexpressing lipocalin-2 in parental cell lines, cells that have no particular propensity to grow in the leptomeningeal space, and found that overexpressing lipocalin-2 um, accelerated the growth of these cells in the leptomeningeal space and hastened the death of the mice. We were particularly keen to address this issue of site specificity um, and so um, took a look at growth kinetics of cancer cells um, with, with and without lipocalin-2 in various um, orthotopic sites and found that really um, losing lipocalin-2 expression does not alter the growth kinetics in either the lung, the subcutaneous tissue, or in the mammary fat pad, um, suggesting that um, this dependence on lipocalin-2 appears to be um, really specific to the CSF. Now, thankfully, lipocalin-2 has been really well studied uh, previously, and we know that lipocalin-2 um, is, is downstream of NF-kappa-B and STAT. Um, and so we thought, well, it makes sense. We know that this is a quite inflammatory um, site of malignancy. And so we went ahead and queried our single cell data set again, this time looking um, for inflammatory signatures and found that our macrophage indeed um, express some pro-inflammatory signatures. And so we thought perhaps the, the macrophage were responsible for the, the cytokines that might induce lipocalin-2 expression. To address this, we turned to our mice um, and collected macrophage either from the spleen or from the CSF of the mice um, and used these macrophage as source for condition media. We found that it was really just macrophage from the CSF in the presence of leptomeningeal metastasis that were able to induce uh, lipocalin-2 expression in the cancer cells. We wondered which cytokines might be responsible for this. Um, and to answer that question, um, we took human spinal fluid and immunodepleted various cytokines and found that the most relevant cytokines for this process were IL-6 and IL-8. Um, in some data that I'm not showing you, we, of course, went ahead and did the ADVAC experiments, adding back recombinant um, cytokines to artificial CSF. So this inflammatory signature to me was really, um, really thought-provoking. And so I asked the, the computational biologist if he could possibly um, look for M1 or M2 signatures. And really consistent with what others had shown in the past in other human data sets, Unlike what we see in mice, where we see these very discrete groups of M1 and M2 polarized macrophage, we see these non-reciprocal gradients in, in human disease. Um, perhaps pretty interesting to me, actually, was that, you know, this, um, these data formed a, a bit of a triangle. And so I asked, you know, what, what's forming the other point of the triangle? If one point is M1 and the other point is M2, um, what other... Um, what other hallmark signature might be um, forcing that gradient? And it turned out to be hypoxia, which of course makes perfect sense. I just told you earlier that the, um, the spinal fluid is profoundly hypoxic. And I'll just remind you of that in terms of neuroanatomy. Um, the CSF is actually downstream of the venous circulation. So the CSF is going to be uh, even, have a lower oxygen tension than even uh, the venous blood. So we queried our data set once again, this time looking at hypoxia um, consensus signatures and iron transport signatures, and we found that they were beautifully correlated. Um, and what, I'll just draw your attention to this because I, I think it's really interesting, is that you know if we look at these golden colored cells, the cancer cells, they're really sampling this entire transcriptional space, right? They're really solving this problem of how to cope with a hypoxic environment and needing to um, fulfill their iron transport needs. This is really different than the macrophage monocyte populations here in red that are kind of clumped. And of course, they're epigenetically constrained. They really have to behave like immune cells, whereas the cancer cells are wonderfully misbehaved and can solve all, all kinds of metabolic problems however they wish. Um, that said, we weren't entirely certain that uh, under the, the stress of leptomeningeal metastasis, the spinal fluid might remain 
hypoxic. Uh, my previous work had shown that leptomeningeal metastasis alters the blood CSF barrier function. And if that were the case, then we could imagine that the oxygen tension might um, rise and in fact be resolved in the setting of lepto. So to assess this problem, um, you then went ahead and created a dual reporter system, uh, this time with um, NLUC uh, downstream of a hypoxia inducible element and FLUC um, that remained a constitutive reporter. So this way we're able to see hypoxia as you can see here in red signaling as well as tumor volume here in white. Um, and as we instilled the cancer cells into the CSF, the cancer cells immediately encountered a hypoxic environment, as you can see, um, but despite this hypoxia, they went ahead and grew anyway. We then confirmed this with um, some more traditional means through um, HIF-1-alpha and HIF-2-alpha staining. So what about our original question, which was about iron? Um, to answer this question with the, really the correct amount of detail, we had to, to collaborate um, across town with um, one of my friends, Tiffany Thomas, who runs um, an induction uh, coupled mass spectrometer. Um, and this is really the best way to measure elemental um, iron in biological systems. So um, what uh, Tiffany did for us is she measured um, iron, cellular iron in our system. And we found as we might expect that um, when we, uh, in the presence, when we knock down either slic 22 a 17 or lipocalin 2, we reduce the amount of cellular iron in the cancer cells and we can rescue this by either adding back lipocalin or adding back transferrin, right? The canonical iron transporter. If we take these same cells and we put them into mice, we find that, of course, as I showed you earlier, if we knock down lipocalin 2, um, we reduce cancer cell growth in the spinal fluid. But adding back transferrin rescues a substantial amount of that growth. Um, and the uh, survival curves um, act accordingly. So we next asked this question about what about the, the other kind of iron hungry cells in the system? Um, particularly in the brain, we know that macrophage are um, exquisite, almost vacuums or sort of hoovers of, of excess iron in the brain. Um, and we wondered what on earth these macrophage were doing um, next to these cancer cells that seem to be so able to gobble up iron. And so then Tiffany took a look for us to see um, the iron content of this time, the CSF macrophage. And we found that um, where, whereas in the presence of LPS, the macrophage seem to be able to maintain their iron stores. In the presence of leptomeningeal metastasis, uh, the macrophage iron stores were appreciably lowered. Moreover, by knocking down lipocalin 2 expression in the cancer cells, we were able to restore macrophage iron cellular concentration. So of course, this could be you know, biologically irrelevant. It's hard to know exactly how much iron a macrophage really needs. Um, and so to assess that, we took a look at some iron-dependent processes um, of macrophage, including um, phagocytosis and generation of a respiratory burst. And in both cases, we found that in the presence of leptomeningeal metastasis, CSF uh, macrophage um, phagocytosis, as you can see here in B, and CSF uh, macrophage respiratory burst generation, as you can see there in C, are inhibited. And again, we can rescue this activity by knocking down lipocalin 2 expression in the cancer cells. So it seemed to us that this was really uh, kind of a beautiful story where the cancer cells and the macrophage were both sort of competing for this um, limiting iron in the extracellular space. And we wondered what might happen if we chelated all of the iron out of the extracellular space such that basically no cells would have access to it. Um, in order to carry out this experiment, we either treated the mice with um, intrathecal desferoxamine, which is an iron chelator, early in the course of their disease or late in the course of their disease. And we also employed intrathecal D-penicillamine. Penicillamine is a copper chelator. We found that treatment with the iron chelators um, inhibited a growth of cancer cells in the spinal fluid really beautifully and provided a, a survival effect, a survival benefit for the mice. We found that uh, D-penicillamine did not. So taken together, these, um, these observations suggest that uh, the inflammatory microenvironment of the CSF induces um, 
cancer cells to, in, to express lipocalin 2 and SLIC22 A17. And that expression of these gene products allows the, the cancer cells to access this limiting extracellular iron. In doing so, the cancer cells are able, of course, to supply their own iron so that they can um, multiply and divide and kill the mouse, but they also inhibit the, the macrophage's own ability um, to perform the macrophage's duties of phagocytosis and a respiratory burst. I'm really pleased to report that um, this uh, novel approach, this sort of preclinical approach that I'm, I'm showing here, um, is being brought to the clinic um, where the, the clinical trial is going through our IRB currently. And so with that, I wanted to thank um, all of the people that did the work, my wonderful laboratory, um, my really fantastic and, and generous collaborators, and all of the um, funding sources that make this possible. Um, but more importantly, I wanted to acknowledge my patients and their families. I hope you can appreciate that they're um, it's not just the analysis of their clinical samples, but really their clinical data and their just generosity throughout their disease course that enables us to study um, this disease. Thanks so much. Thank you, Adrian. Really, really nice uh, uh, set of discoveries. Um, so there is, uh, I mean, I just realized that we are running really close to six. Uh, we will finish at, at six. So uh, maybe uh, I can um, sure. give you one question uh, that I have from the audience, uh, and then we can move uh, with the with the rest of this because just try to see whether we can have at least five minutes of discussion. Is that okay with you? Of course, of course. Okay. So uh, um, uh, uh, Michael should uh, uh, ask you: uh, Did you check what the major tumor-associated macrophages population was composed of? Um, if peripheral derived uh, Max are in general uh, other leukocytes. Do you believe that the CSF itself might represent a more beneficial route of infiltration of immune cells rather than via the parenchyma? Hmm. So, um, in order to really answer that question properly, we um, we've carried out um, some lineage tracing experiments with uh, with macrophage. Um, just to be able to assess whether the macrophage and the CSF are resident versus bone marrow derived macrophage that are infiltrating in. Um, so, so far it seems as though the, the macrophage um, early in the course of the disease are about 50 50 um, resident versus bone marrow derived infiltrating macrophage. And then as the disease progresses, it becomes more um, overwhelmed by the bone marrow derived macrophages infiltrating. Hmm. So, um, I do think. We see the macrophage coming in through the choroid plexus um, and not through the brain parenchyma. Um, that's, and that's of course just in our mouse models where we're able to trace the macrophage. So I agree, I think that um, it really depends on where the inflammatory stimulus is neuroanatomically in terms of where the immune cells are going to come in. So if, you know, if we're talking about the leptomeninges, I think they're gonna wanna come in through the, um, the choroid plexus. Um, but if we're talking about the brain parenchyma, of course, then they're going to want to come in through the, the vasculature there. Thank you, Adrienne. 